I am Nicholas Bornois of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you today to our uh, webinar on the container sector. We are privileged to have with us uh, four major uh, companies uh, involved with container shipping. And uh, uh, Ben Nolan, the head of maritime research at uh, Stiefel, uh, is going to moderate the discussion and introduce the panelists. Uh, two very quick uh, remarks. Uh, the first one about the disclaimer that uh, these webinars are for informational and educational purposes. They do not constitute investment advice or advice of any kind. Um, the second uh, is that uh, you can submit your questions uh, during the session uh, using the button at the bottom of your screen, or you can email them to us at uh, questions at capitallink.com. Uh, and uh, these questions will be addressed uh, at the end of the panel discussion. Uh, by the way, this uh, webinar will be available as a replay later on for those who would like to access them uh, upon demand. And uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, Ben, Aristides, Constantine, Ian, and Evangelos, and I'm turning the floor over to Ben. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Nicholas. And, and as always, I appreciate you uh, hosting these types of events and, and certainly also including me uh, and as part of that. So thank you very much. Um, the container shipping world has, uh, at least not in my history, never been quite as uh, volatile as it has been over the last three years. Uh, and in general, I think that has worked out very, very nicely for each of your companies. Uh, although lately it has been a little bit more challenging, I think. Um, so I thought a, a good path for, the, for our discussion here is to maybe talk a little bit through the fundamentals of, uh, of what is driving some of that uh, at the moment, um, downward momentum, but um, trying to identify uh, as best as we can um, what the outlook uh, holds for us. So uh, I think that the best place to start there is demand. Um, I think uh, certainly here in the United States, uh, we've seen some consumer softening, um, but uh, but that's probably true elsewhere around the world. And we've definitely seen the, the box rates, which is most pertinent to your customers, uh, come down almost 80 percent um, in uh, it, it, what since the beginning of last year. Um, acknowledging that you guys are, are less directly connected to box rates themselves and maybe tangentially through your customers. I'm curious if, uh, if you guys have yet begun to see any light at the end of the tunnel. I know that rates have flattened a little bit. Um, it, do you think that's indicative of a recovery or is it just, you know, a, a part of an onward downward progression? Uh, any uh, any bold prognostications out of any of you? Yeah, I'll I'll kick that off, Ben. I suppose um, you're you're right. I mean, we're not directly affected by what's happening in the freight markets, um, but but clearly our customers are. And you're also right that in our view, at least, container charter rates um, have plateaued, flattened. Uh, call it what you will. Uh, uh, they're certainly down from the record highs we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and whilst they're down, they're still above levels that were uh, prevalent three or four years ago. Um, so it, it looks you know, reasonably positive for, for our side of the industry at, at the moment. And one of the, the big factors that's affecting the supply of capacity or the amount of effective capacity, um, which uh, helps to support charter rates, uh, is um, slow steaming, which is as a result of the decarbonisation initiatives from the 1st of January. Um, uh, uh, you know, we've seen lots of statistics. I'm sure the others have got similar statistics from their own fleets, but our our fleet has slowed down by 9% um, uh, Q1 2023 compared to Q1 2022. Um, that is a massive um, withdrawal of effective capacity. Uh, which will help to support uh, charter rates and and the freight markets. Um, 
we're small and mid-sized container ship owners most of us on this call um there are some big ships but uh, most of us focus on mid-sized and smaller which serve the regional trades um so a bit more focus on regional trades and away from the main east west trades um uh, which would be exemplified by the shanghai containerized freight index etc is good for us uh, so potentially increased demand from further re uh, regionalization of global trade um and uh, reduce supply from the effects of decarbonization yeah, anybody else go ahead evangelist if, if I may, ben, yeah. and you know i don't have a crystal ball to know where demand how demand is going to evolve there, there are many uh you know geopolitical and generally exogenous factors these days influencing that and obviously we've seen a uh post covid a shift from consumer spending on goods uh, to services and traveling and you, you've seen prices in aviation or hotels explode on the other end uh, and and that has all contributed to um, to lower volumes being carried uh, hence the softening of the of the box rates but it's we can talk about the macro picture of what demand is doing and so on and so forth but it it also makes sense because people some, sometimes tend to uh, sort of not confuse, but make parallels between our fortunes and where the, the broader macro, macro picture is going. We are fixed for the next three years on average. We have close to 100% charter coverage for this year. It's close to 85% for next year and more probably above 50% mm. for 2025. And we are fixed at very, very healthy charter rates that we managed to put in place, not just the nows, but probably all of the people on the panel during the good times. So our income statement and our cash flow statement uh, is not subject uh, to, uh, to, to volatility uh, in, in box rates. We do care about the health of, of the freight market for liners because to the extent that that determines their ability to service uh, the contracts that we have in place with them. Uh, but these guys have amassed billions upon billions of cash over the past couple of years. Uh, we see very little, uh, you know, it's practically non counterparty risk, it's practically non existent. Uh, and yes, their income statements uh, have taken a hit especially if you compare them, because when, as you issue results this year, you have to compare them to last year, and that will always be painful. But they're still in the, you know, they're still in the black. They're making less profits, but they're not burning cash. So uh, uh, I just wanted to make that point because I speak to a lot of uh, investors who, who sort of are struggling to make this distinction. We'll get to that in a second, um, because I think it, it's an important distinction and, and there is a difference between box rates and ship rates. Um, but it, while we're still sort of on the on the macro demand side, another thing, and actually there was already a question that came into it, but it was one of the things that we discussed previously uh, as a talking point. Um, one of the uh, one of the areas that uh, certainly I'm hearing a lot about, and we do hear a lot about in North America, is um, the idea of the reshoring or nearshoring of manufacturing to North America, as opposed to manufacturing in China or Vietnam or or wherever. Um, and it, I can tell you that um, at least at, at, at least in, as a talking point. Uh, it is something that a lot of people are focused on. Um, do you view that as an existential threat to demand for container shipping? And maybe uh, Constantine and Aaron, Aaron see if we haven't heard from you yet. It, 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 either of you have an opinion on that, on what that might mean? Well, sure, I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy to take take that one as a as a starter, Aristides, and and uh, you might want to chip in. Of course, I mean we have we have seen relocation of production over the last uh, three four years quite quite a bit and it started with with trade war where we have seen you know volumes out of china going down certain production facilities being relocated to southeast asia i mean that has been a trend that we have observed for a while already 
Um, and whilst you know volumes out of China have come down, uh, less China does not necessarily mean less torn mile demand and certainly not, not less containerized demand because we have seen quite a few volumes being shifted to Vietnam, to Bangladesh, et cetera. I mean, that is, that is I think, one trend that, is, that has been observed that has, of course, been accelerated somewhat by um, uh, the COVID situation and, and the, uh, you know, the, the feel of people that they are quite dependent. Um, and there was a, another shift of diversification of supply chains. Um, I personally believe there will be more shifting also maybe to Mexico, maybe to Eastern Europe, but certainly within Asia. Um, but I don't necessarily see that as a negative. Uh, to the contrary, we have seen this year, uh, the last uh, four months compared to last year, um, uh, first four or five months of the year, that there have been significantly more, especially smaller trades being opened, actually 50% more. We have seen around 70 new trades being opened um, um, with mainly smaller vessels, uh, which is actually evidence to a bit of a shifting in trading pattern. And usually if you start a new trade with smaller volumes, you start that with uh, smaller ships. So I, I personally think that there will be a continuous shift in uh, in demand, um, but that is not ne necessarily net negative um, if you look at it on a on a global scale. But um, I'll see this. I'm sure you have some 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 additional thoughts on that. Well, obviously, we've we've witnessed the same facts, uh, Constantine, and I can confirm that this is what is happening. Uh, and indeed, we are seeing uh, charter rates for smaller container ships uh, being very healthy. In the last couple of months, we've seen an increase uh, in, in that. In fact, the last uh, in March, according to Drury, the throughput through containerized of containerized cargo increased by 5.4 percent and reversed the drop that we had been seeing up to now. Now, if this is going to continue, obviously will depend a lot on how things develop uh, globally and how things develop within China. And if uh, China flattens uh, uh, as it seems possible today, uh, that might have an effect. But uh, the, the effect of all these things that uh, Constantine talked about, uh, we're seeing Southeast Asia being very strong. Uh, have been to lift charter rates to levels that had we not had the fantastic two years that we had before, we would, we would all be partying today. If you're making, you know, $20,000 a day with an old uh, 2,500 TU ship for a year, we would party every other year except the previous two. So rates are good. We are all making money even at today's levels. And of course, what will happen will depend a lot on on uh, on how the the world develops uh, and if the world will continue to grow or not. I think this reshoring is has uh, that we are seeing uh, will also uh, depend a lot on how the global politics play around. Because for sure, economically, it makes sense to have globalization. And I think the power of economics is so big that uh, globalization will come back to us if we resolve a little bit the global tensions which are making people want to not deal with other countries. I think this is something which is impossible to happen in the longer term. You know, we are all one world and so, so this will correct itself and we will get back to globalization and the fact that shipping is so cheap, uh, such a cheap form of transporting will assure that in the future we will continue to manufacture things wherever it, it's more economical. So I'm also for the longer term optimistic and the shorter term we've seen that these discrepancies and this building of a two, uh, or, you know, of a two party world, the Democrats and the autocrats or however one wishes to call it, uh, has also positive uh, implications be because it increases the, the trade routes that we have to do. So I have to say that I am optimistic uh, in the longer term, and perhaps you want to go to the supply side, or may I make an intro to the supply side? The, the, the only thing that is currently scaring is for the short term, 
the high order book that we have. And I'll stop here. We'll talk about the supply. Right. Yeah, we we will get there. I did have one last demand level uh, question, and and I. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your uh, your comments about sort of geopolitical populism. I think is uh, probably the right term for that. So it, we'll see. I think it is uh, um, it, with respect to sort of global trade, populism is something worth paying attention to. But um, as it relates to demand for ships, um, specifically, uh, you know. Do you, how do you think, uh, you know, Ian, you mentioned uh, slow steaming, which has obviously helped quite a lot, but um, uh, to the extent that box rates remain low, to the extent that the profitability of the liners is less, uh, we've actually seen an improvement in, in charter rates for most classes of ships here in the last couple of months. Uh, can that be sustained and um, and is there any risk, and this is a little bit of a setup question, but do you think there's any material risk that some of the liners come back and say, you know, uh, we, we signed rates on ships that were orders of magnitude higher than where they normally would be? Can we, you know, adjust those down or something else, some, some sort of renegotiation of, uh, of charter rates that, that Evangelist, you've mentioned, you're, you're making tons of money no matter what, but is there a risk that the liners say that you're going to have to share the pain? Anybody that wants to tackle that. <laughs> Let me say this, uh, and because obviously this is a recurring question also from investors. Yeah. Um, we, I've been in this industry for like 20 years, and we've never had, and I, I'm not aware of an occasion where one of the big guys, the big players, the big liner companies, uh, has ever gone to any owner and said, listen, we fixed the ship at $60,000 per day for five years. The market has now dropped. Let's reduce the rate. Okay. This is not how things are done. Uh, we're talking about a few players. You have long-term relationships with these people. That are, you know, These relationships go both ways. Uh, and definitely, uh, we don't expect to have re-neck discussions, especially given the financial health uh, that these companies enjoy these days. Um, therefore, I mean, the only reason why you would suffer from a contract would be if that company were to you know, go bankrupt or, or were to reorganize out of court. We have seen in the past Hanjin going bankrupt. We have seen Zim um, doing an out of court restructuring with its creditors, including ourselves. Uh, but in the normal course of business, for uh, to expect liners will come back and renege existing contracts, I don't see that uh, happening. Um, so uh, to me, this is something which uh, also needs to be made clear. Uh, is that universally agreed? Yeah, okay, I, I, I agree with that. Um... Uh, there have been casualties in the past, uh, and no doubt there will in the future, but we all deal with uh, the, the, the bigger, well-behaved guys, uh, by, by and large. Um, just to remind people, half the container ships, well, actually less now, but yeah, approximately half the container ships are owned by folk like us and chartered out to the operators. Um, so, the, And those operators need not necessarily every single ship from the charter market, but pretty much all of them for most of the year. And if they can't access the charter market because they've got a bad name, uh, because they've reneged or defaulted or whatever, they haven't got a business. Um, uh, so they, they have to be very careful about trying to renegotiate terms. And I'm sure all of us would um, would, would countenance a, a bilateral discussion to help our customers as long as we helped ourselves as well. We've done it in the past. Uh, amend and extend or lower for longer uh, with some of our customers, which adds contracted cash flow to our business and gives uh, the customer a bit of a break on rates. Um, you, you also asked Ben about support for current levels, charter levels, charter rate levels. My crystal ball isn't any good either, um, <clears throat> but you know the, the fundamentals of supply and demand remain you know, reasonably supportive. Um, if, if you factor in the, the relatively modest order book for mid-sized and smaller ships, if you factor in 
um, the increased age of the fleet and the increased likelihood, particularly if there's a bit of a downturn, uh, the older tonnage is going to get scrapped out. I, th I think we've worked out that if, if all ships over 25 years were scrapped, combined with today's order book, then the mid-size and smaller fleet grows on a net basis by a little over 1% over the next three years. Um, and that's ignoring the effect of increased regulation for uh, emission control, which is potentially likely to increase increase slow steaming and therefore a reduction in effective capacity. So there's no reason why the charter market shouldn't remain supported, but a lot of it is to do with sentiment, um, as 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 we all know, uh, and that's that's fickle and unpredictable, and uh, comes back to geopolitics often. Right. Ben, if I can add my two yeah, cents on, on, on what uh, Ian just said. Firstly, uh, just to reconfirm what the others uh, said, we can only expect issues with the charterers if they are at the brink of defaulting, the, because otherwise they cannot afford it. That does not seem at all possible, especially with the bigger names that are 90% of the business of all of us. So I would not be afraid at all uh, of, of this uh, issue uh, at, at this stage. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I leave that point. So let's let's move to the supply side. Uh, you know, as uh, Aristide, as you mentioned just a little bit ago, the one of the uh, larger concerns is the size of the order book. Uh, I hear that pretty consistently. Um, and uh, it, it, despite the fact that box rates have come down and sh even shipping rates have come down, um, it, while ordering is not anything close to what it was, I'm surprised every week to see new orders coming out. Um, that's despite the fact that, sh that ship prices are also a lot higher. Um, I know a few of you guys have ships on order uh, or have even done so this year. Can you maybe talk me through uh, how, how you get comfortable with ordering a ship, uh, the residual value post the end of its current contract or its upcoming contract? Maybe anything around uh, why someone would uh, consider uh, placing a new order right now. I'm happy to to start off on on that note. We have uh, we have four ships on order. All ships that we have ordered are fully de-risked to the charter that we have concluded at the same time. So, so we actually have secured EBITDA above construction cost. So I think those those kind of uh, transactions, which is probably not an uh, off-the-shelf uh, transaction that you can, can do in the market, but uh, we have prepared for those transactions um, for quite some time and have then been able to you know, nail down a contract plus a uh, charter simultaneously. So no speculative uh, order. Uh, this is the way we think about it, uh, and and I think this is not possible throughout the bench, but it's possible selectively if you have a very close dialogue with your customers. Um, and I'm not saying this can be repeated; otherwise, everyone would do these kind of deals, um, of course. But um, at least you know the secured EBITDA on all four new builds uh, significantly um, exceeds the construction price. So, so that's that's number one. Be selective, um, um, and and at the same time, make sure you 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 know um, how to move uh, forward on that basis. Having said that, um, I think if you look at the supply side and the order book in general, it's also dependent, you know, on on what sector to order, right? I mean, everyone looks at this huge order book, and it is huge, admittedly, but it's so much skewed towards twelve thousand EU and above, which is firstly. Um, uh, a bit of a different sector. Of course, there's cascading taking place, and there's always a question, well, what does that do with the smaller ships? But if you look at age profile and order book in combination, you will see that the smaller sizes below 8,000 U are significantly underrepresented from the order book perspective. Secondly, this is the sector of the market that is mostly affected by the need of adjusting speeds for uh, regulation. Um, so there's another element to it. And, and for example, below 3,000 TU, you have more than 1,000 vessels on the water today that are above 20 years of age. So, so there are so many elements that if you look at the order book in general and look at the specifics of um, the order book, that need to be considered. And lastly, 
um, uh, and, and that's maybe ste stepping back a, a bit to the demand side. But if you look back historically, with the exception of 21 and 22, um, where the mainland trades grew quite a bit as a kind of you know, resulting effect from COVID and catch up, um, the intra-regional trades have always grown disproportionately stronger, um, which are the trades of the smaller vessels than the mainland trades. This is statistics that can be evidenced. And if you look at the vessels that trade in these intra-regional trades, 98% of the vessels there are, are below 5,000 TU. So you have a very low order book there. You can strike deals here and there. You should not overdo it, in my view. Um, from a speculative uh, point of view, we will certainly not do that. But you can certainly structure nice deals also to renew your fleet. And that is at least our perspective on uh, ordering activity and, and the supply side, especially when it comes to the smaller sizes. Right. Any other views on ordering ships or everybody likes the small ones? Well, Constantine, you couldn't have said it uh, better uh, as if I was speaking. Uh, I totally agree. We do have an order book. We have one difference uh, with the Constantine, which is that uh, we ordered uh, nine ships uh, last year, uh, small ships to, uh, from 1800 to 2800. Only two of them we secured with such a lucrative time charter at the time that we ordered them. Uh, which is the vessel that we took delivery of last month and the one that we will be taking off delivery next month. Uh, the seven vessels that come into will come into the market in 2024 are currently unfixed, but uh, we believe we bought those ships uh, at a low price. Today, we could even sell them at a much higher price than what we bought them, even though the second-hand prices have dropped. Uh, new building prices have not dropped and it's not easy for them to drop because there's not too much availability in shipyards to build ships today. So we feel very confident that we have bought relatively cheap ships, which we will be financing through the earnings that we have secured on our charter parties. And therefore we feel very comfortable that we've done a very secure deal there as well. And everything else that uh, Constantine mentioned uh, is true. Only 12% of the ships over the, the order book on ships under 3000 TU is only 12%, whilst the ships under 3000 TU that are over 15 years of age is 50%. So we definitely see that uh, this is a space that will probably need uh, more ships despite the cascading. So I, I'll stop there because otherwise I'm marketing. Okay, and I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I do. Um, in I believe you guys don't have any new uh, new orders placed. Is that correct? So do you have a different opinion? Is it, uh, as someone who hasn't participated in the new buildings that have gone on? Do do you? Well, uh, our, our our strategic approach is is to maximise the existing life of existing tonnage or the useful life of existing tonnage. Um, you know, pending uh, agreement on the future fuel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we we think there's there's plenty for us to do in the used ship market. We've we've recently announced the acquisition of four um, eight and a half thousand TU vessels with decent charters attached. Um, for, for us, we think that's that's the way to go. Uh, for others, new builds, fine. Um, uh, there's there's clearly a market there, and we have um, through Technomar, we have built ships in the past, so we're you know we're not averse to it in principle. It's just we don't think it's right for, for global ship lease at, at this moment in time. Uh, and, and then, oh, I mean, ahead. just to give a bit of my perspective, I mean, we currently have sixty eight ships in the water and Aristides mentioned of the average age. The average age of our fleet is like 13 years old. And yes, there is still plenty of life um, for these ships to, to, to generate earnings, but you need to have some sort of fleet renewal thought process in your mind, right? And uh, I'm not saying that for someone ought to go all out as certain other companies have done. We have placed to date we started building an order book uh, from the middle of last year. 
We now have eight ships on order, all in the seven, eight thousand AU range that we believe is going to be uh, the workhorse of, of the future. Uh, the specs of these ships are, are all, uh, you know, they're uh, scrubber fitted, they're methanol ready, and in any event, even by burning conventional fuel when delivered, they will still be the most emissions friendly or fuel efficient vessels out there, if you will. Uh, and we believe that in any event, uh, they will be in high demand in the coming years. Uh, just to give you an example, six out of those eight ships we've recently fixed for three years. When we ordered them, we did so um, in an opportunistic manner. We did not seek quickly to fix them, uh, exactly because the, the strength of, of our balance sheet allows us to follow such a strategy. For this number of ships, I mean, I'm not talking about a much larger uh, bet. Uh, and we have now fixed them for three years, and the EBITDA that they will generate will uh, will uh, will reduce the investment by 40% within three years. So, uh, you know, it's you know, I believe it's uh, it's something that ought to be at least it is on our mind. Um, we do have plenty of capital to allocate, uh, and we're doing it um, uh, mindfully. We're not sort of just placing orders for the sake of growing. Uh, but this is a parameter that is also uh, right. on our... Uh, right. So if let's, let's pivot a little bit to, uh, you know, I think demand is a little bit of a question mark. Supply is maybe a bit of an overhang or a headwind. Uh, one of the tailwinds for the industry, and really not just the container shipping industry, but all shipping, uh, are some of the environmental regulations that are um, set to have an impact. So if, if we could, one uh, again, one of you who uh, maybe this is uh, near and dear to your heart, can, can we run through sort of what, what we're looking at with respect to EEXI or, or CII and, and how, how you anticipate the incremental regulations playing out with respect to ship supply, ship speed, removal of assets, et cetera. Well, may I, may I start yeah. by saying a, a, a few things? Uh, I'll keep it very simple because our uh, uh, listeners uh, don't want to get into the depth of, uh, of the technical part of it. But uh, the EXI is... Uh, one calculation that you have to do, which might result in you needing to reduce the maximum output of your, of your vessel. This has been done. Everybody has calculated that it doesn't have a huge effect. Uh, it, it might reduce the maximum power of many ships, but they don't use it anyway. Even the elder ones, they don't use the maximum power. They use much less than that. So that has, does not have a huge impact. But the CII, which is uh, something that you have to monitor every year and see how much CO2 you emit every year and uh, reduce that, that is very important. And that is what is going to have consequences in the market. And we see it already uh, affecting the vessel speed. Vessel speed over the last couple of years have dropped by 1%. Uh, which by, by one knot, which is about six to seven percent drop, which is a, very, is a very substantial drop in speed. It has to do with the fact that the markets have been softer, but it also has to do with the, the CII requirements. And these requirements, uh, although at this stage there is no enforcing mechanism to say that you have to definitely keep your vessel at a certain standard, every serious charterer is, is paying great attention to it and insists and wants that the vessels they are using to be characterized as C or better, which is C is the medium level. Uh, but there are many ships that today calculate as D or E with the current speeds they are trading at. They will have to reduce the speed. So we do anticipate that there will be significant speed reduction going further. With the introduction of the ETS, which is the other rule that we expect to come, uh, the European ETS, which is the most imminent, but we will see other 
jurisdictions follow, uh, which essentially means paying a tax for the, the fuel for the CO2 emissions that you are emitting, uh, will have as a result that thirstier ships will get penalized most. So the more echo the vessel, the bigger the advantage it will have. And that's why we're going to see echo vessels, uh, conventional echo vessels, earning bigger, uh, better rates than the elder ships until the market falls so much that we start seeing all the other ships going for scrap. If that happens, at some point it should happen. Uh, but for a brief time, because after scrapping will correct itself, I think that the markets will be good again. So, so I think this is the effects of, of uh, the new regulations. Of course, the later uh, effect is that we will not be using fuel oil. We will have to be using some other kind of fuel. LNG is an, in the, an intermediate fuel. You know, the EU accepts it as a green fuel, but really it's not. It's just 20% less uh, uh, CO2 emitting than normal fuel. But it's an intermediate fuel. And then we will go to some of the greener fuels. But I think it will take, uh, you know, at least a decade before something really becomes really commercial. I tried to keep it as narrow. Uh, that was how, as, no, that was that was uh, both narrow and deep. So how how how's that? <laughs> yeah. okay. Maybe a short addition from from my side on on that subject because I think CII will also do one one additional thing that that uh, sometimes uh, is not considered in the equation of supply and demand, and that is. Uh, and, and I'm sure all of us here on the call will do retrofitting either as joint investments with our customers or, or you know, just on our own. Uh, so we will see as a result of CII more retrofitting taking place, uh, which in turn means more downtime of assets, i.e. an impact on supply. Um, we will see a lot of demand for retrofitting facilities. We will see fewer vessels being available, hence to the charter market, and then all the supply demand forecasts, this is not considered accurately. And if you talk to any of the large liners, retrofitting, and to your point earlier, Ian, I fully agree, uh, a key priority is to extend the, the uh, lifetime of the existing assets, and we do the same, um, by investing into these assets, which in turn means capacity is taken out of the market. Another effect next to slower speeds from CII, which will have a huge impact on the market over the next two to three years, because capacity will be taken out of the market. Um, I think that is a very important factor. Difficult to, to put a number to it, admittedly, but the number in any event means longer docking times, more of hire, um, and hence less supply available to the market. And disruption in service offering, by the way, because you need to adjust your services if people if vessels get uh, phased in and out for doing retrofits. And, and related, related to that, if I may add, I mean, and Aristides alluded to it. I mean, th there is no way we, we're going to see adequate production of green fuels in three years' time, right? And obviously, the only recipe at this point is slow steaming and retrofitting. And in our view, it's very probable that in the, in the short to medium term, we will have carbon capture technologies developed that will be the solution for the industry for the medium term. And yes, we may ultimately transition to green fuels or other more eco-friendly propulsion solutions. But if you think about it, you know, it's going to take 20 to 30 years for the shipyards to, to build the ships of the future. This cannot happen overnight. Shipyard capacity is, um, is, 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 is limited. Um, and, and therefore, uh, you know, retrofitting uh, to install carbon capture technologies and so on and so forth, uh, you know, will mean considerable downtime. We're not there yet. We, we do not have ready uh, solutions, but I believe that uh, there is no way within the net, through 2030, let's say, we can move away from the fuel we are burning now. And the only solution to mitigate emissions will be some sort of capturing carbon um, through a, a carbon capture technology that uh, will develop. Right. Well, and that is, uh, you know, in my personal opinion, I, I agree with you. I think that's probably the path of least resistance. Um, but, uh, but 
there doesn't seem to be any consensus around, um, you know, I, one person says methanol, one person says LNG, one person says ammonia, one person says carbon capture, one person says slow steaming. <laughs> uh, again, it, to me, it, it, it is, uh, it's hard to imagine trying to make a capital allocation decision uh, when there's so many unknown variables. Um, and that gets to my next question. Um, do you think you, you guys are effectively ship leasing companies? Um, you operate the ships, of course, but um, but you're not the end user per se of the ship. Uh, do you think it makes more? Do, well, does it make sense for for companies like yours to be the leaders in technology and innovation, or should that? probably be a little bit more the responsibility of the liners who are, you know, leasing your asset. Well, well we, yeah. I was going to say, well, there's no reason why we shouldn't be leaders if we want to be. I mean, we're the, I, I agree completely with what the others have, have said about decarbonization. EIX is easy. CII is more difficult. Collabor collaboration with between owners and, and operators to to work more effectively, um, energy efficient ships are key. Um, you know, hence new buildings are, are being designed to be as efficient as, as possible. Carbon capture we see as being short, oblique, medium term, you know, a big potential solution. Uh, and, and we're invested in one of the kind of startups. Other, others on this call are as well, we know. Um, so kind of why not? But none of us have really got the scale of the oil majors, for example, uh, to put billions of dollars to work to kind of try and future proof their businesses. Uh, we, we we can't do that, but we can influence on the sidelines. Yeah. I maybe, think, Ben, maybe. that... Okay, Alessides, please go ahead. So, sorry, Constantine. Uh, okay, I'll go ahead, I'm quick. Uh, I, I think from our part, uh, we, we are there to help and participate, but really I, I agree with what you said that the major uh, players in the market, the liner companies are really pulling the strings here. They are all much, much bigger companies than us and they are pulling the strings together with uh, manufacturers of ships, engines uh, uh, and, and the whole universe around us. We are here to facilitate and perhaps build ships that might be chartered by, uh, by the charterers for a significant period of time, if that helps. But really, we, are, we don't have the capacity on our own to develop the new technologies. And frankly speaking, I really have no idea which is the technology that is going to be the winner. If I had, I would invest, uh, but I, I really don't have it. So yes, that's my answer. Maybe just a, a few comments from my, my side. Uh, we are also invested in, in, in a synthetic fuel startup, for example. We'll probably do a test run uh, early next year. Um, um, obviously, the fuel is, is uh, extremely expensive compared to conventional fuel. That, that, that is the, the situation. Having said that, uh, I think we, need to, we all need to get a bit of exposure and collaborate with our customers. And that's also why I think on at least on this panel, we are probably the, the only ones who have ordered uh, methanol dual fuel vessels. Um, so, so real methanol vessels. We also have some methanol ready, um, but methanol dual fuel vessels, um, because we believe out of a collaboration, you need to start somewhere. And as long as it makes economically sense um, for the owner and for everyone else, um, these kind of projects can be developed. Is that something that we can roll out tomorrow on the whole fleet on this globe? Certainly not, um, because there are different drivers behind fuel availability in the different regions. There are different support schemes in different regions, um, um, different fuels that are being uh, subsidized, uh, different technologies that are being subsidized. So I think we're just at the beginning um, of, of, of the whole rollout of uh, uh, the energy transition for the shipping industry. However, I think we're, we're also you know, taking conscious decision um, selective, mindful about you know the, the environment, but also mindful and about our your own exposure and balance sheet. And that's I think you can move ahead with these projects. We get delivery on our um, methanol dual fuel vessels uh, second half of next year on a 15-year charter, fully de-risked through the charter. Um, will they run on methanol from day one, green methanol? Time will tell. Um, 
but you need to start somewhere, especially if it makes economically sense. And I think collaboration, partnership um, is a key. It would probably be the first uh, green corridor in Northern Europe because it's small ships. So the, the need for, it's not a need for a high quantity of uh, green methanol. So I'm not that pessimistic that that can be sourced. Um, but again, uh, for us, it is also an economic decision, but to partner up, sit down, uh, try to work on solutions and to take it step by step is at least the approach that we take on, on that path. Okay, great. Um, I, there are a lot of questions and I want to make sure that we have time for them. So I'm going to condense uh, a few questions that I had thought about with respect to the competitive environment into one. And, and that is... Um, the uh, with respect to your company, obviously there's been a lot of consolidation among the liners. Uh, there has been some consolidation or or at least some bigger companies within the owners. Uh, do you expect that to continue and maybe in conjunction with that, um, you know, obviously there's been a pullback in the equity markets, but uh, the fact is it's been almost 20 years since uh, since some of you guys have been public companies, uh, not, that's not true for everybody, but um, and still the largest market cap here is 1.2 billion. Um, so it's it's small to micro cap. Um, is is the public markets the right place for capital um, and or and or should there be consolidation among your companies such that you know we we're talking about more. Uh, um, investable vehicles. This okay. Let me let, let me start. Uh, I, I, so yes, we've been public for for very many years, and uh, this has enabled us to grow from a very small company to to a small company. <laughs> so uh, I think we're still the smallest company amongst the ones here today on the panel. Uh, but we now own uh, 20 ships. Uh, we started off with three. Uh, the market uh, and being part of the capital markets helped us raise the equity that uh, we needed to, go to grow even to this size. Uh, we hope that uh, the capital markets might offer us a similar opportunity in the future to grow further. Uh, however, this is not the case now. The, uh, all valuations are extremely low, uh, and uh, it hasn't been. Uh, uh, the valuations have not been uh, high and supportive enough of uh, uh, capital raises uh, over the last few years. And in fact, over the 15 years that we've been public, I think it's been only two or three years that you felt that you could use the value of your stock in order to grow non-dilutively so but, but the opportunities came and they've come two or three times within this period and uh, on the other hand we we are public yes so why is that bad for us it keeps us disciplined it helps us uh, manage the company in a much better way and it has helped us raise money from other sources or talk to counterparts uh, we who realize that we are a very open and transparent company. So, so even the non-tangible effects of being public, I think are extremely important. If you couple that with the opportunities that arise, you know, every now and then, uh, we have no intention of, of, of taking the company private or doing something like that. We realize that now is not the right time uh, to to use our equity as uh, as a force of uh, growing the companies further, but I'm quite confident that opportunities will arrive in the future. Uh, we are a cyclical business, and as uh, being a cyclical business, uh, it is often the case that uh, the public markets don't really grasp it or grasp it fast enough in order to play that market. But I think that overall, uh, it, it makes sense for companies to, to, to be public. I don't regret it personally. Uh, and I think, well, I don't know, I let the others speak for themselves. 
Um, I, I agree with basically with what Aristides said. You know, we're very happy being public. We have accessed all sorts of public uh, capital over the last um, 15 years or so. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, on the consolidation point, Ben, yeah, there's scope for further consolidation. The the imperatives for ship owners to consolidate are different from those for operators. Um, that there's there's huge economies of scale and operating efficiencies that can be achieved by crunching two large liner companies together. It's less clear that you can achieve, obtain operational cost savings by putting together um, ship ship owners who've got pretty efficient ship management operations anyway. That that said. Um, increased size gives better access to capital which comes back to the public markets question partly as well and increasingly um increased size allows you to bear the burden of uh regulation decarbonization and everything else um you know if you own one ship you're going to have to deploy just as many uh just as much brain power in working out what's going on with european ets and eix and did did are as if you own 68 ships um so there's 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 definitely some um some gains from scale there well um i there's a lot of questions coming in and we're running out of time but one of the things that i did tell you guys and that that i was going to do and now is that time uh where i have right here my my phone and i'm going to have a 30 second stopwatch on here and and for each of you guys you're going to get 30 seconds to deliver your very best elevator pitch as to why people should buy your stock which you know your public companies you should be in the market to sell your equity right so um any volunteers that want to go first in our uh, in our lightning round stock pitch yeah, I'm not sure. right. perfect okay I'll, I'll tell you when you ready Ian? okay uh three two one and i'm going to stop you at the end Three, two, one, go. Right, global ship lease, 68 ships, $2.1 billion of contracted revenue, spread out over two and a half years. Robust balance sheet, focus on the sweet spot, mid-sized and smaller ships. Uh, dynamic capital allocation, sustainable dividend, stock buybacks, opportunistic growth. That'll do. Not even 20 seconds. Wow, blazing. Great. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll trade my 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah, there we yeah. go. All right. Uh, who, who, any volunteers to go second? We're all volunteer you. Okay. All right, good. I was going to pick you anyway. You were top on my screen. All right, Aristides, you ready? Three, yep. two, one, go. Okay. Uh, 20 vessels, extremely strong balance sheet, uh, a strong renewal uh, program, which is uh, going to give us nine new buildings, the most eco ships uh, in our space. 40% less consuming than uh, older ships, very uh, fixed revenues over the next year and the year after and the year after. Uh, within two years, just the fixed revenues. Yeah, have... stop. <laughs> no, 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 that's the good part now. <laughs> I, I, I have to be fair. I have to be fair. Ian's 10 seconds, Ian's 10 seconds, and I'll pay him after. <laughs> Our dividend of 50 cents per oh, 50 well, cents per cent. <laughs> I, 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 buyback program. All right. All right. You owe, you owe Ian a bit. 40% below now. <laughs> okay. Uh, Constantine, you are next. You ready? Ready to, to run. Two, one, go. MPC container ships, uh, 62 ships, four new builds on order, very clear backlog, clear dedication to return capital investors. We have paid more than 600 million in dividends over the last 14 months, which adds to the market cap, strong stock performance, very prudent capital allocation, very clear structure, clear focus, distinct focus on the smaller sizes, um, and five seconds remaining. Thanks. <laughs> All right, there we go. I'll take them too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, now it's not your chance. Uh, okay. Evangelos, are you ready? Yes. Three, two, one, go. The Nows Corp. 68 ships, the best financial position we've ever been. Uh, very strong balance sheet gives us the ability to access opportunities. 2.8 billion of contracted revenue for the next three years on average. Uh, prudent capital allocation, uh, steady, sustainable dividend. 
and uh, very attractively priced. All right, perfect. Again, you four seconds under. Uh, Hair Steve's would have taken all of that too, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't need to talk. I, <laughs> we do have a, uh, a few questions and there's, there's several that came in about uh, capital allocation. Um, you know, I, I think most of you guys pay dividends. Uh, I, all of you pay dividends, I believe. Um, but uh, the, the question, a lot of questions have come in about how the share prices are really uh, depressed and multiples are low. And how do you think about uh, buybacks as a function of uh, returning capital? I mean, if I may uh, answer this, um, as you said, we are trading at deep discounts to fair value. And one, one, one can argue what fair value is, but definitely it's not where we're trading. And it makes more sense in terms of capital allocation, basic principles to buy back your stock rather than uh, increasing a dividend. It's much more uh, productive. And therefore, we have a, a, a $100 million buyback program, which is active. We've executed on almost half of it. Uh, and we will continue buying back stock. Definitely, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a very good investment. And uh, we believe it's, it's the most, let's say, democratic way of, of you know, giving value to your shareholders uh, through the buybacks. Uh, but, you know, one should not overdo it because then you start hurting your free float, your liquidity. So, you know, you need to have a balance of, of uh, how much you do. But definitely, it's something that uh, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, we do as well. The global ship lease, we buy back stock as, as part of capital allocation. Um but we're also keep an eye uh, eye out for growth opportunities uh, to to steal my boss's expression. You've got to feed the cow to be able to milk the cow. If you want dividends, you need to um, renew the fleet. So yeah, ben, all oh, go all, ahead. All, yeah, all, all, all the four companies here uh, they they have ample liquidity coming in and. Uh, we are all balancing uh, between paying dividends, doing buybacks and keeping money for growth and even delivering uh, the company. So we are all doing the same thing. We have that you know, fantastic opportunity with all this liquidity and all these profits that are coming into the companies. I really don't understand why the market is not uh, uh, seeing that. Obviously we're not doing such a good job you know, telling I, I wouldn't, to, the, uh, to the market. I, I wouldn't put, uh, I wouldn't uh, take too much self-blame. I mean, I, I, I could opine here for a little while, but I do think that cyclical businesses in general uh, are either really, really cheap, at, but nobody cares, or, uh, or, or they're on an up cycle. So it, it doesn't seem like there's much middle ground. Um, in my opinion, but um, th this is sort of an interesting question, big picture. Uh, what do you think are the biggest uh, possible headwinds for the next three to six years? Uh, maybe it's a bit pessimistic for a shipping panel, but anything, any things that might keep you up at night other than some, you know, whatever order books some of the things we've discussed. Well, I, I personally think a, a big threat because it is an uncertain whether it's 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 headwind, tailwind, time will tell. But it's obviously the geopolitical situation, right? It's it's just such a wild card that that is super difficult to to predict. Um, and and of course everything that affects the demand side. And and we have seen over the last uh, five, ten years so many ups and downs on 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 demand implications um you know be it COVID in the beginning being a disaster for tonnage providers then being a, a pretty much accelerator for tonnage providers i think those kind of uh, extreme events geopolitically maybe uh, macroeconomically those are the only wild cards uh, affecting the demand side that that i think are not the only but those are certainly elements that would create a different uh, market environment and and would mean we need to adapt having said that um, all of us have low, I mean, we have 15% leverage, 
I mean, the others also have very low leverage. I think we are, we are there to weather the storm uh, and maybe even that is an opportunity. Uh, I, I always consider that as a glass half full, but generally and globally that in my view could be a, a wildcard event that will change the, the, the game in a way. And to add on what Konstantin said, if this happens, which is a possibility that uh, the global uh, you know, geopolitics uh, turns uh, very, very sour, that will have the effect of pushing the older ships into the scrapyards and get, providing a huge opportunity for the future. And because of our strong balance sheets, I feel very confident uh, about uh, all, all, all the companies on the panel today. Well, we uh, there are still a few more questions, but in an effort to try to keep it around an hour because we could go for a lot longer. <laughs> um, I think we'll, we'll probably I'll probably cut it off here. Uh, I do want to say um, to each of the four of you, thanks for putting up with me and my uh, my lightning rounds and everything else. And uh, and again, I, I appreciate Nicholas and and the whole Capital Link team for inviting yeah. all of us to participate. Mm -hmm.